Hey guys, Nathaniel Jordan here, and today I wanted to talk about George W. Johnson. Not the congressman from West Virginia, George W. Johnson, or the British writer on gardening, George W. Johnson, but the pioneer sound recording artist, George W. Johnson. Now, Johnson had a pretty interesting life, and he really doesn't receive a lot of recognition for being the first African American recording star. Due to the fact that Johnson's music is roughly 120 years old, I uploaded two of his most popular songs to YouTube back when I was first starting this channel around 2012 and 13 without infringing on copyright law. Both videos received a pretty good amount of attention, so I wanted to talk about his story and kind of elaborate on who he was as a person. Now this is something I'm going to do as accurately as possible. Could you just imagine that over a century after your death that someone's telling the story of your life in an era that you wouldn't even recognize? You would hope the person would talk about your life how it really was and not what the public perception might be. But anyway, I digress. Now Johnson was born sometime in the mid-1800s. While his exact date of birth is unknown, it is often reported that he was born in October of 1846 in Virginia. Although it is not confirmed, it is believed that he was born into slavery and was freed around 1853. Now Johnson possessed a number of abilities that many African Americans from his era were sadly robbed from ever getting to learn. He learned to read, write, and perform music. Johnson was a servant and laborer in his youth. He moved to New York during the Reconstruction era in the 1870s, where he would begin to employ his musical abilities as a street whistler. <laughs> Johnson would have probably done this for about a decade or so, as he wasn't recorded until around 1890. One day, while Johnson was performing in Manhattan, two phonograph distributors looking for recording artists heard his boisterous voice. Their names were Charles Marshall and Victor Emerson, and they asked Johnson if he would like to record on a wax phonograph cylinder, which could be played back on coin-operated machines. Johnson accepted the invitation. Now, it's important to know just how repetitive the process of being a recording artist was in the 1890s. A sound recording could not be duplicated, so popular recording artists would have to perform the same song up to thousands of times. At most, a strong singer could create three to five recordings from the same performance by having multiple phonographs facing the singer's mouth. Johnson was paid 20 cents for each recording and was accompanied by a pianist. Sometimes Johnson and the pianist would perform the same song 50 or more times in one day. I think that's enough to drive the normal person crazy, but he was persistent. Johnson's first best-selling single was the light-hearted yet incredibly racist The Whistling Coon. It was essentially a minstrel song, and featured both singing and whistling. Here's an excerpt from an 1891 recording of the song. His second major hit was The Laughing Song, which as the name hints, features laughing in the chorus. Here is an excerpt from an 1898 recording of the song. Now this song is equally racist and would be unacceptable today, but it's strangely also very joyful. While George W. Johnson would record some other songs like Listen to the Mockingbird and The Whistling Girl, he was basically somewhat of a two-hit wonder. However, these two songs were enough to launch him into star status, becoming the first popular African-American recording artist. It is believed Johnson sold around 25,000 to 50,000 copies of his songs from just 1890 to 1895 alone, and based on 19th century standards, that is a huge accomplishment. Johnson was now performing on vaudeville and had at least one recording session in Thomas Edison's lab in 1891. Through his vaudeville theater performances, Johnson met another early recording artist named Len Spencer in 1894, and the two became lifelong friends. In 1895, Johnson would start recording on new disc technology for several companies, including the Berliner Gramophone. Johnson's popularity began to wane around 1905, 
as recordings could now be duplicated thousands of times, and there was no need for him to record each individual copy. His final disc recordings were somewhere around 1909 or 1910, and Johnson began to fade into irrelevancy. He became financially destitute, and was hired by his old friend Len Spencer to work in the Lysum Theatre as a doorman. Spencer, who saw continued success as his friend's success diminished, allowed Johnson to live in his office building. Johnson lived the last few years of his life in Harlem, and would pass away in 1914 from pneumonia and mitocarditis. By then, Johnson was forgotten, and was buried in an unmarked grave in Kew Gardens in Queens, New York. There are some rumors about Johnson's life that are untrue. While some believe that he was lynched or hung for committing murder, neither of these stories are true. Johnson is believed to have never married or had children. However, he did have two common-law wives who both died under strange circumstances. His first wife was a German woman who was found dead in their shared apartment around 1894 or 1895. His second wife was found beaten in their apartment and died in 1899. While both of these stories do sound suspicious, it is important to note that Johnson was tried and found not guilty. It would be almost a hundred years after his death before Johnson would receive any sort of recognition. In 2013, the Maple Grove Historical Society successfully campaigned for a plaque to be placed at his grave granted by the Music Cares Foundation. A ceremony to celebrate Johnson was held the following year to finally recognize his life. There was a number of displays and performances on April 12, 2014 to celebrate the life of George W. Johnson. This would have been a hundred years after his passing. Now, listening to his music today can evoke a large variety of different reactions. I know some people are fascinated to hear recordings from a man who was born 170 years ago. I'm one of those people. I am truly fascinated to hear recordings this old. However, there's some other people that find the music amusing and, you know, they enjoy the simplicity of it. Some listeners may feel unsettled by the low quality of the music, especially from the Laughing in the Laughing song. While George W. Johnson's music provides a window into an immoral era of racial segregation, there is no denying that Johnson was a pioneer who is deserving of recognition. And I think I will end it at that. Thank you guys for watching the video, and I hope you found it informative. I would like to make more content like this in the future, so if you guys liked the video, be sure to like, subscribe, and comment. Have a good day.